Well, Happy New Year already. Yeah, I don't make uh, New Year's resolutions, Mickey. <laughs> I gave up on that a long time ago. I, may, I make a resolution not to make a resolution. How's that? <laughs> Otherwise, I'll get myself in trouble that way. So uh, take your Bibles, turn to Mark 6 in your Bibles this morning. We have some visitors today. Jeff from Speedy Plumbing. Good to see you today. Those of you who don't know Jeff, you know Jeff. You see his red van running around town all the time. He does a lot of work for the parsonage and here at the church, and he's very good to us, and so I just kind of want to give him a plug. If you've got any plumbing, plumbing problems, and if he can fit you in the schedule, this man is busy. He's going to be 60, and he works by himself. He's a one-man band. He works 10, 12, 14 hours a day. I need whatever it is that you're taking. Yeah? Keep me going. Good to see you. And there's others here today that are visiting. Thank you so much for coming. Don't mean to exclude you. Uh, Jeff's just uh, one of our one of our own, a good friend of mine, and like I said, does a lot of work here for the church and is good to us when he does that. If you'll notice uh, the peril of unbelief this morning, uh, let's, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then we'll explain the passage to you this morning. And we have communion this morning as well, so if you didn't come prepared, you know that we have communion the first uh, Sunday of every month. We should always be ready for communion, amen? We should be living a life surrendered to the Lord, sins before God, and uh, ready for communion. But just in case that's not true, you know there's going to be communion the first uh, Sunday of every month, so we always need to be ready for that. I think that's part of the reason why we have communion on a regular basis is so that we can stay ready. Amen? Wouldn't it be awesome if uh, before the service is over we could go together in the rapture of the church and have communion there live, huh? Before the Lord. That means you'd probably get out of here early. Amen. Amen. Verse 1, Mark 6. And then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hand? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, and Josie, and Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Now he could not do mighty works there except that he laid hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Just the revelation of your Son revealed to us in Scripture through uh, this one apostle's hand, Lord, uh, John Mark. And Mark, the the one closely associated with the apostles, was there. Lord, what a blessing that we have. The the preservation of the Scriptures some 2,000 years later in our hand, Lord. We should never take that for granted, but always be excited and enthusiastic about the fact that we have a copy of God's Word and we're so free with it. But in this particular passage of Scripture, Lord, you, you reveal some, some very profound, very incredible truths about you and about people, about your own family. And today, Lord, we just want to consider that. Pray that through this passage, through what we, we learn from this this uh, passage of Scripture, that our hearts would be um, convicted and our hearts would be encouraged that we would be ready for communion this morning. This being the first, first, uh, first week of the new year and the first Sunday of the new year, Lord. May this be kind of a launching pad for us into a new year, ready for the, for the blessings and the challenges of all that the new year brings. Uh, we take counsel in knowing that uh, not only do you know the future, but you're already in the future because you created the future. You determined it. And so this morning, Lord, as we look into your word, we just ask that you'll speak to our hearts from it. In Jesus' name, amen. If you can remember back to the first Sunday in December, a lot of you can't do that, but if you can, you remember that we've already looked at the passage in some degree. We called it uh, without honor or no honor. And that was from Luke. We brought that message last time from Luke. This time we're going to focus in a little more 
Actually, we're going to focus totally in on Mark's gospel. I took you to Luke last time because there was some detail in Luke that isn't in Mark, but there's detail in Mark that isn't in the other gospels as well. So we want to take a, a closer look at Mark's gospel this morning in this passage. I've entitled this morning, The Parable of Unbelief, because that's what's happening. The, the town of Nazareth is not believing in Jesus at all. They reject him, as we'll see in another passage of Scripture. But we're going to be looking at that. Mark, Mark points out some interesting facts that we don't get from the other writers, and so that's why we're here this morning. We're not going to finish all of it either. We're just going to stay in two verses. We don't really have all the time to, to get through it. We could rush through it, but we don't want to do that, right? We want to get as much as we can out of it. And even so, even though we're spending some time in just a couple of verses, we're not getting everything out of it that I think we could get out of it uh, just because of the sake of time. We have communion today as well, so we want to make sure that we have time for that. But... Mark starts verse 1 with letting us know that this is a training exercise. This is a training exercise. And we learned from last time that his own country spoke of Jesus' hometown of Nazareth. So he's leaving Capernaum and he's heading towards his own hometown. Hometown like uh, Imperial. Hometown of Imperial. How many of you live in Imperial? How many of you lived in Imperial your whole life? How many of you you were here in Imperial in the 60s? All right. How many of you were here in Imperial in the 50s? Okay, you're, you're getting older. How many of you were here in Imperial in the 40s? 50s? Uh, 30s? Anybody here in Imperial in the 30s? Wow. Back there, yeah, some old timers. Do, do I dare go back to the nine, uh, 20s? Did I go back to the 20s? Hometown. And it was probably, that, probably the case for Jesus when he was in his own hometown, his own home country, or his own country. There were probably people that were new to the town, probably people that had been there forever, forever as he's coming into town. So he's been gone, he's been away for a while. Uh, he's been out ministering. The word is getting out in Galilee that uh, Jesus of Nazareth is doing mighty things. He's an incredible preacher. He's uh, healing the sick. He's raising the dead. He's doing awesome things. And so in his, in his uh, dust, so to speak, or preceding him even, is all this churn about Jesus of Nazareth. And this is their home town boy their hometown boy okay so we learned that that last time his home, home country spoke of his hometown his own country so no one can say that jesus uh neglected his own country nobody can say that he neglected his own his own town because he didn't okay he did not he wasn't he wasn't so busy out there that he forgot his his own little town of nazareth which was very small much smaller than imperial at the time very small. The gospel record shows that he went to his hometown in the fullness of time. And, and rightly so. Very important. He had already, there had already been question as to his identity. And I believe that in a kind of in a microcosm, Nazareth was representation of the people of Israel. Nazareth rejects him and then Israel later rejects him. He was in his hometown and then later in his home country, in all of Israel, and, and at both levels. He was rejected as the Messiah. So I think that was very important. And he had every intention of ministering to them, uh, as he did elsewhere. Um, we also see his, that, that in that intention, his disciples followed him. And we talked about that last time, if you were here the first Sunday in December. Um, they would be learning from the Master. They would be learning from the Lord. They would see firsthand just how ugly people can get. Just how ugly people can get. In fact, later on down in, in, the, in the book, later on down quite soon down in the book, they get to experience some of how ugly people can get. And so they were going to learn that. There's the good things about people. There's the good things about ministry. And then there's the difficult things about ministry, the hard things about ministry. And then there's the ugly things about ministry. And that's what this passage reveals. A lot of this passage reveals the ugliness of people. These were people in the synagogue. These were religious people. These were his own people. His own people. Like Mickey and I. Stand up, Mickey. Look. Look look how close Mickey and I are. Look at that. I've known Mickey all that time, all this time, right? And look, we're dressing the same now. <laughs> right? But seriously, though, some of you people, those of you who grew up with me as a, as a young boy, in this town, uh, either you or your parents, we're like family, right? We're like family. We're close. 
And you, you would expect uh, that kind of treatment. You know, I wouldn't expect Mickey to treat me the way these people treated, treated Jesus. You know? In fact, I think it was Mickey when uh, Wayne had, in, uh, had announced his resignation. I think it was Mickey first that said, I wonder what Pastor Albert's doing. Right? Yeah. And so I just said that because I want you to get a picture of what was going on here. They would see firsthand how ugly people can get and they would later experience the same kind of rejection, the same kind of hostility, uh, even the same kind of persecution that comes from your own people. Well, notice in verse 2 and 3, this begins to get a little bit interesting here. It starts with the reaction of the people. Okay, So that's point number one. That's as far as we're going to get this morning. The reaction of the people. How the people reacted to Jesus. Let's read it again, verse 2. And when, when the Sabbath had come, that's important because this is the day of what for them? It is the day of it's a day of worship. Okay, yeah, rest, that's right. Sabbath, it's the seventh day, the Sabbath day. But it was a day of worship. So where were they? They were in the church house. Okay? Not called the church because the church hadn't been developed yet or hadn't been born yet, but it was the it was their house of worship. The Sabbath. And he began to teach in the synagogue. They would do that. They would let uh, visiting uh, rabbis, visiting teachers, itinerant preachers, if they were visiting, they would allow them to come up and speak. Now that's 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 dangerous today because we never really know who somebody is or where they're at, but then they, were, they would speak within the, within the parameters of their own faith. Okay? And, of course, they allowed Jesus to do that. And many hearing him were astonished. And remember I told you last week that you see that all the time, the word astonished, all the time. That is the reaction of the people, amazed, astonished. They tend to get involved emotionally. But it never usually goes beyond that. So they're astonished and they're saying, where did this man get these things what are they asking? What are they asking there? Where did this man, this man, what man? This man, Jesus, the man, the, the man, the boy that grew up in town. Where did he get all this? He's just the carpenter. Okay, they're already lowering his credibility by saying this man and the carpenter. They could have at least said the carpenter's son, but they say the carpenter. They're lowering him to a man who was... Simply just a tradesman, somebody who worked with his hands. Nobody in particular, nobody special, not a mayor, not a senator, you know, not a rich guy, just kind of a lowly carpenter. They're already not feeling good about this situation. And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James and Josie and Judas and Simon and his sisters not here with us? And they were what? They were offended. They were offended. They're basically saying, we know the guy. We know the kid. You know, his family's here. We know them. Close connections, close ties. There might have even been family relations. Of course, there were family relations in town. Just like there are family relations here. I've got family here, blood relatives here as well, and close friends that I went to school with. And the last part of verse 3 tells us that this, this wasn't a good reaction, right? They were offended at him. So it's definitely not what we would call a, a warm welcome. Not a warm welcome. We all know what it means to be offended at someone, right? How many of you have been offended at someone? Come on, you can raise your hand. How many, honestly? Everybody should raise their hand. Everybody's been offended by someone. I ask you to say, how many of you have been offended by the pastor? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> all right? Can pastor offend people? Of course. Why? I'm human. I'm human, okay? I can do things unintentionally that are wrong, and sometimes I do things that I probably shouldn't do or say that hurt people, and when I know, I try to go and fix it. They were definitely not approving of him, okay? We all know what it is to be offended by someone, and they were not approving of him. And when someone's offended, there's disapproval, right? When someone's offended, they are not approving of you. You know the body language that people give you, right? You can usually tell when somebody's offended uh, because they want you to know. They want you to know that they're offended. So they have a certain negative body language. The ones who are offended but don't want you to know, you'll never know. And they're, they're going to get over it on their own. They have decided, you know what? I'm going to get over this on my own. But the ones who are offended and want you to know they're offended, they let you know by their body language, right? They do. And so you can usually tell they are disapproving. And guess what? Nothing that you can do can change that. You know, it says in Proverbs 18, 19, a brother offended is harder to win than what? 
a fortified city. A fortified city. A brother offended is harder to win than a fortified city. You push, picture that in your mind. Being in the military, I know what a fortified city can look like. And a person who's offended cannot be win, cannot be won by the one no matter what you do. And it also says, and contentions are like the bars of a castle. Like the bars of a castle. Okay? Can't get in. Impenetrable. Well, verse 2 and 3, if you'll notice, it reeks with contempt. In fact, familiarity is what we're being taught here. Familiarity breeds contempt. Right? It breeds contempt. And it reeks with contempt. It's obvious that they've already formed their opinion about Jesus. They were pumped and primed and ready when he came. They were ready for him. They were looking for an opportunity. They had already determined their position in their own mind of who Jesus was. And they were just looking for an opportunity. And he gave it to them. Right? He gave it to them. They were just waiting for a chance to express it. They'd, they'd have obviously discussed it among themselves. And the incident in the synagogue gave them a chance, and they came out swinging. They came out swinging. Again, this was not a warm welcome. This was an attempt to humiliate and to discredit. And this is as ugly as it gets. It's as ugly as it gets. Notice Luke chapter 4 with me for just a minute. Luke chapter 4. It can get pretty ugly in the church, too. Just like it can get pretty ugly in the synagogue. Pretty ugly. Luke chapter 4, verse 20 and 29, it shows their hate for him was such that they tried to murder him. Their own hometown boy who grew up there for some 30 years. They tried to murder him by running him off a cliff. Notice verse 28. So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath. I kind of bold typed that word, wrath. That's that kind of anger that builds and builds and builds and finally explodes. Finally explodes. They had had it up to here with their anger. Now they were going to act upon it. What were they going to do? Kill them. Let's kill them. And that's what they did and rose up and thrust him out, out of the city, and they led him to the brow of the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him down over the cliff. This is awesome. Then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. How could he do that? You know, have you ever been in a, have you ever been in a group of people, say, say a thousand, at least maybe 500, 600, 1,000 people that are out to kill you? How many of you have been in that situation before? Little Julio's back there raising his hand. You know. <laughs> How do you walk through a crowd like that unless you have some kind of divine ability, amen? Yeah. He'll make reference in a minute, and John will look at, he says, my time is not at hand. You know, he just walks through. Now look at Lazarus wasn't a large town. Everybody knew Jesus and his family. We've already established that. Just want to take a look at that again. He was one of their own, and yet they treated him like public enemy number one. That's how he was. He was the worst, biggest threat to them in their mind. He came there to minister. That's what he came to do. He came to do what? He came to feed the hungry. He came to heal the sick. He came to forgive their sin, right? He came to preach the gospel to the poor. He came to raise their dead, and he came to offer them eternal life. He also came to offer him as, his, as their Messiah, the long-awaited king of Israel. That's what he came to do. Instead of welcoming him, instead of embracing him, instead of supporting him, instead of believing him, Instead of following him and honoring him, he was met with offense. He was met with opposition. He was met, met with a great deal of suspicion. A great deal of suspicion. Indifference, hatred, and, to top it off, an attempt on his life. I thought of the words of Proverbs 6. Will you turn there with me? Proverbs 6. The words of Proverbs 6 came ringing in my head when I thought about this passage.
Notice verse 16 through 19. Taking the words, they're very powerful. These six things the Lord, what? He hates. I think every translation uses the word hates. Does God hate? Oh, you better believe it. And here they are. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. The first one, a proud look. Okay? God hates, and it's abomination to him, a proud look. Second, what's the next one? A lying tongue. Third, hands that shed, what kind of blood? Innocent blood. Third, a heart that devises wicked plans. Be careful when the plans that you are making are wicked. Feet that are swift in running to evil. A false witness who speaks lies. That means somebody who's accusing someone else, and it's all lies. It's all lies. Okay? False accusation. Be careful when somebody comes and starts accusing someone and trying to uh, defraud their testimony. Anyone who sows discord among brethren. Do you see how much God hates discord sowers in the church? Pretty powerful, huh? Pretty powerful. Now, this level of hatred for Jesus didn't just happen at the moment, okay? It didn't just come out of nowhere. It wasn't an instant thing that just kind of was there as he came into the synagogue. It had to have been cultivated. It had to have been cultivated because you don't go from, you know, here comes the home guy, come in, you know, I haven't seen you for a while, heard all great things about you. Oh, we want to honor you. It's so awesome. And then from that to wanting to murder the guy. No, it had been building. It had been building. The animosity, the hatred, the spies that they had for him was building. It had to be cultivated. It had to start with someone or several someones. It had to start that way. Someone fleshly. Someone carnal. Someone who takes pleasure in hurting others. Someone who has availed themselves to the devil's work. Someone like that. Someone who themselves have been hurt. That's why they lash out. They've been hurt, and the hurt's never healed. Someone, as Proverbs 6 says, someone with a proud look, a lying tongue, a heart that devises wicked plans, uh, someone with feet that are swift and running to evil, someone who bears false witness, someone who sows discord among brethren, someone who delights in shedding innocent blood. And the very root of it all, the very root of it all what? Satanic! satanic. If God hates these things, the devil loves them. Right? Because the devil doesn't love anything that God loves. And so definitely satanic. And the reaction, it's a lot like the reaction we saw in Mark chapter 3. So I want you to turn to Mark chapter 3 real quick. Mark chapter 3. You say, Pastor, I can't remember you ever preaching a message like this before. Well, I'm in my fourth year now. I think I got my tenure. I'm locked in. As long as God wants me locked in, amen? But I don't know, maybe he'll take me over, the, over to the side of the new river and try to throw me off. That'd be a horrible way to die in all that muck. <laughs> Looks like chocolate milk. That was a bad one, huh? Mark 3, notice verse 20 through 26. Then the multitude came together again so that they could not so much as eat bread. We talked about that already. But when what? His own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. That is not a, that's not a good thing, okay, to lay hold of him. But they said he's what? He's out of his mind. You see, they have already developed an opinion about Jesus way before Mark chapter 6. In Mark chapter 3, they've already developed a, a, an opinion that he's out of his mind, that he's crazy, Okay. He's one of those cultics, one of those crazy religious fanatics. But they said he is out of his mind, and the scribes who came down from Jerusalem affirmed it, right? They said he has Beelzebub. So now not only is he out of his mind, but he's also what? 
demon-possessed. Okay? And by the rulers of the demons, he cast out demons. And so he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. So it's obvious from this passage that the scribes from Jerusalem planted the ugly lie about Jesus' identity. At least, for the very least, they got him thinking that way. Okay? And I just want to say this. Even his own people tried to stop him. And this might have been, all this might have been taken back to Nazareth and it was cultivated there. Cultivated there. You know what I mean by cultivated, right? It went from mouth to mouth to mouth to mouth, from mouth to ear, from mouth to ear, from mouth to ear, and it built and it built and it built and it built. And destructive discord always starts with a small bit of gossip, a little bit of gossip. That's how it starts. And people who love it love to propagate it. And it gets bigger and bigger and uglier and uglier till the whole place is upset, till the whole place is upset. Small bits of juicy false information. People jumping to conclusions, making judgments themselves with all, without all the truth, before all the truth has come in. Okay? And it just has to be told to someone. And I just kind of put a little scenario here. I can hear it now in the corners of the synagogue. Okay? And that's when things happen. That's when gossip happens. It happens in the corners of the church, in the back back there by the back door or over here around this door or somewhere in the nursery apart from the pastor's ears, right? Go something like this. Brother. Sister. We need to be praying for Joseph and Mary. Oh, poor things. Those poor guys. You heard about their son. Jesus. You've heard about him, haven't you? You've heard the rumor, haven't you? Right? You know, there's always been that question as to whose son he is. Right? Brother, sister, we need to pray for them. We need to pray for them. That poor child, he's gone mad. He's gone mad. And then it turns into something very ugly, but you know what? There's more, and it goes deeper. Notice verse 31 and 35 in that same passage of Scripture. Look, then his brothers, his brothers, and his mother came. And standing outside, they sent to him, calling him, and a multitude was sitting around him. And they said to him, Look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother and my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers, for whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. I used to wonder why he didn't just run out and welcome his family or say, Hey, well, bring him in, bring him in. They're my family, my family. Well, it's implicated here that the news about him had reached the family and the negative news about him had reached the family and they came to collect him and take him home to save him from himself, to take him away from his work. Take him back to his carpenter shop where everybody accepted him. I believe Mary never doubted, but his brothers, they didn't believe. I think Mary may have been there to add balance to the situation, perhaps, of the care of a mother. The brother's on a rampage. Let's go get that brother. He's gone crazy. And she says, wait a minute, wait a minute. And she goes, and she's there, and she's playing the mother role trying to hold these boys back. That's speculation, but I have a hard time believing that Mary ever doubted with all that she went through from the very beginning. But to top this off, John reveals the true feeling of Jesus' siblings. I want you to turn to John 7, because he does. He reveals the, the true nature of Jesus' brothers. Next week, God willing, we'll look at the reality of these men, the identity of these men who Mark and John revealed to us as his brothers. In fact, Mark gives us names 
that's really important. When the Bible gives names, that's, that's pretty important. John 7, are you there? I love to hear those pages turning. Verse 1, after these things, Jesus walked in Galilee. For he didn't want to walk in Judea because the Jews sought to what? Can, can you imagine? Guy, everybody was wanting to kill him. I feel pretty good, you know. I don't think there's anybody here that wants to kill me. I don't think so. The Lord said, if you hate someone, you've already committed murder in your heart. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand, and his brother therefore said to him, Depart from here and go into Judea, that your disciples also may see the works that you're doing. For no one does anything in secret while he himself seeks to be known openly. If you do these things, show yourself to the world. In other words, if you're such a great and mighty guy, if you're really the Messiah, go and prove yourself. For even his brothers, what? They didn't believe in him. These are his brothers, the ones that Mark just, you know, James and Josie and Judah, Simon. These guys were his brothers, and they didn't believe in him. They lived with him. They lived in the same house. They came after him. He was their oldest. He was the eldest. He was the oldest of the family. You know that kind of patriarchal system that develops in a family, especially in large families, how the younger look up to the older. The older don't look up to the younger. Right? But they didn't believe in him what it says then Jesus said to them my time has not yet come but your time is always ready the world cannot hate you but it hates me because I testify of it that its works are evil you go up to the feast I am not going up to the feast not yet for my time is not yet fully come and when he said these things to them he remained in Galilee now just for the record and we'll speak more on this later we know these are Jesus' siblings because John makes a contrast or a distinction between Jesus' brothers and Jesus' disciples, okay? He makes that distinction there. He wanted to make sure that everybody understood that Jesus had siblings, half-brothers and sisters. And he says these are Jesus' brothers, not his disciples. The Greek word can be used either way. It can be referred to as a cousin, a friend. Uh, Mickey and I are brothers, you know. Sorry to pick on you today, Mickey, but it's, we look like brothers, twins, you know. I'm even starting to get these cul de sacs up here like you said, you know. Yeah, I'm really starting to look like you now. But the context bears out that this is his siblings, his real brothers, because John makes a distinction between Jesus' brothers and the disciples here, okay? So we see that there. Your disciples also may see the works that you are doing. So the context bears out that the, the truth that Jesus had siblings separate from his disciples, who might also be referred to as his brothers by some but this isn't what I want you to see, not yet at least. That comes next week, I believe. John actually out points out kind of an awful truth about Jesus' siblings, and I want you to see it. Look a little closer in verse 1. Okay? There have been given other explanations. John MacArthur gives a possible explanation, but this is what I'm seeing in the passage. I'll try to develop it a little stronger in just a minute, but look in verse 1. After these things, Jesus walked in Galilee, for he did not want to walk in Judea. Why? Why didn't he want to go to Judea? They were going to kill him. They had, a, they had a plot out for him. They had, a, they had a, uh, a contract on his head. Okay? They wanted to kill him. He didn't want to go. Was he afraid to go? No way. It just wasn't his time. It wasn't his time. All right? So you got that, right? Notice verse 3 and 4 now. His brothers therefore said to him, Depart from here and go where? To the very place that he wants to be, or he's going to be killed the very place that he's going to be killed. So your disciples may see the works that you're doing. Why, can't he why couldn't he prove his miraculous you know, ability and his, his, uh, his identity there? Why couldn't he do that there in Galilee? He had been doing it, but I think maybe they thought, well, if you go to Jerusalem, we'll believe you if Jerusalem accepts you. But they didn't care at all about whether he would die there or not. At all. At all. Right? That's kind of a sad commentary. Look, if they loved him, if they believed him, they would have begged him not to go. When Paul said that he was going to Jerusalem and there he was going to be tied and possibly killed, they wept for him and begged him not to go. The church said, please, don't go. You can't do that. And even Peter, out of, out of place and out of touch with the, with the will of God, said, you can't go to Jesus. You can't go to Jerusalem. If they're going to kill you there, don't go. Right? 
Maybe they're looking for more proof. I don't know. Maybe if those in Jerusalem accepted him, maybe they would believe as well. I'm not sure. But either way, what does Jesus say? My time is, has not yet come. My time has not yet come. I'm not going to die today in Jerusalem. Whether you care or not, I'm not going, right? Everything about Jesus then was in accordance with God's will or God's timing, even his death. And they may have wanted him dead or at least were thinking about the possibility. And the motivation, verse 5, the motivation, unbelief. Unbelief. Unbelief is a very, very deadly sin. It can cause all kinds of wicked behavior. And this isn't new in the Bible, right? It happened over and over again in the Old Testament. Remember Joseph's brothers? They wanted him dead. They wanted him dead. Why? Envy. Envy. Well, I want you to see something. Turn to Mark chapter 10 for just a minute. Mark chapter 10. Jesus confirms this truth himself. He confirms this truth himself. Notice verse 36 in Mark. And did I say Mark? I meant Matthew. I'm sorry. Please go to Matthew. It takes two more seconds of our time. I meant Matthew 10. I want you to see what he says. Because he lived this at least for a while. Matthew 10, 36. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. This is Jesus. Do not think that I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace on the bring peace peace, but what? A sword. What's a sword? A sword is a is a, a tool or an implement of what? War. Combat. Okay? That's what it is. It's not a an implement of peace, okay? It's not an olive branch. For I have come to set a man against his father. 36, 10, 36. Thank you. 34 and 35 for, for relevance, okay? Verse 35, I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. That's why that's always happening, right? Verse 36, okay? Verse 36. And a man's enemies will be those of his what? His own household. Isn't that sad? Could it be then that some of the ugliness about Jesus and Nazareth started from members of his own family? Only God knows. Only God knows, but all the evidence is there that they at least weren't very approving of him, to say the least. What we know for sure in today's passage is that unbelief can be very, very, can be a very, very, very deadly sin and result in serious consequences. Verse 5, right? Now, there have been other possible explanations. If you have a John MacArthur Bible, there's one that he gives why Jesus' brothers may have wanted him to go to Jerusalem, those also stem from unbelief, okay? But definitely, they definitely weren't concerned for his life, and they didn't believe in him until after the resurrection, amen? At least there was some redeeming quality about this story, amen? After the resurrection. And we'll talk about James and Jude and some of the others. Next week, unbelief can have all kinds of negative reaction to it, people. As soon as somebody gets offended, that's when it starts. As soon as an offense happens... Whether it's a person, your fault or not, when offense happens, it starts to build. And unbelief and distrust and suspicion, it all takes root. Well, let's go back to Mark 6. Mark 6, and I mean Mark 6. Go back to their reaction. We're going to wrap things up. We have communion this morning. All right? Let's read the passage again. And then we'll close and get ready for communion. How's that? That'll get us ready for next week, God willing. 
Verse 1, Mark 6. Then he went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him, that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, the brothers, the brother of James and Josie and Judas and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? And they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet, he is not without honor except in his own country. Among his own relatives, see that? And in his own house. Now, he could do no mighty works there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled. He mar- it's the first time we ever hear or see where Jesus marveled. He marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. We'll try to finish up the passage next week, God willing. If not, we have the whole year to get done, right? Let's bow our heads and close our eyes. Let's pray. And I don't know how the Holy Spirit has spoken to you this morning, but I've been spoken to by God powerfully, not only in my own study, but even here today. God, the Holy Spirit, has been here today. And if you got nothing from the Spirit of God, maybe you're not alive, spiritually speaking. If there's been no, no encouragement, no enlightenment, no illumination, and no conviction, God help you. God help you. Because God is speaking to Imperial Community Church, and maybe even some visitors today. But this is a new year. This is the first Sunday of the new year. And the message is very fitting because we can examine ourselves I think that's what God wants us to do, examine ourselves and see where we've been last year. See where we've been last year and where we would like to go this year. Better yet, what we've been and what we'd be like or like to be like this new year. What was my attitude last year? And how will it be this year? Is there something trailing behind me that I'm bringing into the new year? Is there someone I need to forgive? Is there something I need to make right? Have I judged someone wrongly? Have I slandered someone's name? Am I a gossip? Disguising it with concerns or a need to pray? Am I easily offended but hard to forgive? Do I have a tendency to hurt others because I've been hurt? Am I blind to my own sin? Am I critical of others? 